Transcendent Quran, Realigning Man to the Divine Power Culture. The first ever tafsir written directly in English by one of the best known Quran scholars in North America, Imam Muhammad al Asi. Three volumes of this multi volume tafsir are now available from Crescent International at a special price of $40 per volume, including shipping anywhere in North America. The Noble Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is revered and loved by all Muslims but there is one aspect of his blessed life that is not well known and that is the treaties he entered into as well as the letters he wrote to kings and rulers of neighboring countries. For the first time this book, Power Manifestations of the Sira, examining the letters and treaties of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam discusses this crucial topic in detail. The book is now available at a special price of $30, including shipping and handling anywhere in North America. Order from Crescent International, P.O. Box 747, Gormley, Ontario, L0H1G0, or call us 905-887-8913. Order your copy today. Assalamualaikum, my name is Afifa Khawaja and welcome to Muslim Perspectives, a weekly program dedicated to bringing you news about the Muslim community both at the local as well as the international levels. Pakistan is in the news on almost a daily basis, mostly to do with bombings and killings. Coupled with massive corruption, incompetent and greedy politicians, and an overbearing military, there's hardly anything positive anyone hears about Pakistan, a country that was born amidst so much hope. Let us consider some recent developments that occurred on November 26th with the U.S. NATO attack on two Pakistani border posts that left 24 Pakistani soldiers killed and another 28 injured. The attack lasted two hours. There are strong reactions from the Pakistani government. To shed light on these and other developments, we are joined by Brother Zafar Bangish. Welcome to the program, Brother Zafar. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. Let's start with the U.S. attack on Pakistan, uh, on the Pakistani border post, rather, that left 24 soldiers killed. Um, that includes a major and a captain. When the coordinates of that post were known to the American soldiers or the American military, uh, why did the Americans attack the post? Well, I think it definitely has a lot to do with the manner in which um, the American uh, war in Afghanistan is going in fact, it's obvious that America and its NATO allies have lost the war in Afghanistan. And in their anger, obviously, they are now hitting out at Pakistan uh, because um, they cannot justify their own failure despite all their heavy weaponry and everything. They cannot justify or explain why they have failed in Afghanistan, so they are trying to blame Pakistan. But there is also another factor, and that is that the invasion and occupation of Afghanistan was not exclusively related to Afghanistan. It also had uh, quite a lot to do with the fact uh, that Pakistan, a Muslim country, is a nuclear power. And this is something that, uh, regrettably, uh, the Western countries uh, have simply not been able to reconcile with. They are perfectly happy if, let's say, India, which is a predominantly Hindu country, has a nuclear weapon. Uh, they are quite happy if Israel, a Zionist state, has a nuclear weapon. But when it comes to any Muslim country, they just don't want to see any Muslim country in possession of nuclear weapons. But if the American attack lasted two hours, why didn't the Pakistani Air Force or other military forces intervene to stop the aggression? Well, that's obviously a good question. And uh, the Pakistani military, particularly the high command, has uh, a lot to answer for. After all, they consume a lot of the budgetary resources of the country. And if a, an attack uh, on its border posts lasts for two hours, I mean, surely there should have been some reaction. The Americans accuse uh, Pakistan of allowing Taliban sanctuaries on its borders and allowing attacks to be carried out through these arbitrarily defined borders in mountainous regions. Is this true? Well, technically speaking, yes, it is true um, in the sense that um, there is definitely uh, infiltration uh, from uh, Pakistani side into Afghanistan. But I think we need to uh, 
look at this uh, issue in, a, in, in its proper context. Number one, uh, the, the Pakistan-Afghanistan border is something like uh, 1,400 kilometers long. And although Pakistan has deployed about 120,000 of its troops there, but it is virtually impossible to seal that border completely. Uh, also, in many areas, the border is ill-defined because the same people, the same tribes, live on both sides of the Pakistan-Afghanistan border. So it is very difficult to stop that infiltration 100%. That's the first point. Second. <clears throat> the American uh, accusation against Pakistan is also uh, completely misplaced because, you see, if we look at uh, the fact that uh, the Taliban operations have been carried out in about 97% of the country in Afghanistan. So, you know, there are hundreds of thousands of uh, foreign troops in Afghanistan, 100,000 American troops, perhaps an equal number of their mercenaries, then there are other countries' forces over there. Uh, and yet, resistance is carried out in 97% of the country in Afghanistan. So naturally, not all 97% of that territory is close to the Pakistan border. The third point, uh, you see, if we look at the most spectacular attacks that the Taliban have carried out. These have been, for instance, in Kabul, in Kandahar, even in the north in places like uh, Kunduz and so on. Now, these are far away from the Pakistani border. So while there are American forces on the Afghan side of the border, how is it that they are unable to prevent the Taliban from getting to places like Kabul or Kandahar or Kunduz to carry out their operations? Mm -hmm. So obviously, the failure is not on the part of the Pakistani military. It is actually uh, on the side of the um, Americans. And so this allegation against Pakistan is again meant to detract attention from America and its NATO allies' military failures in Afghanistan. Okay, let's look at the actual attack of the U.S. on the Pakistani border post. What are the implications of this attack? Well, obviously, uh, uh, the, the Pakistani military and government are extremely upset over what has happened. I mean, it's a clear violation of uh, Pakistani sovereignty. Uh, in addition, it's, in fact, uh, an escalation of uh, what the U.S. has been doing. Uh, as uh, you mentioned in an earlier question, the coordinates for these border posts were well known to the Americans. That means they knew precisely where these border posts are located. Now, if they knew that, then why did they attack them, number one? Secondly, why did the attack carry, out, carry on for two hours? So, obviously, there is great unhappiness and unease within Pakistan, particularly when we consider that, you know, Americans have been, you know, riding rough shots over Pakistan and its sovereignty because of drone attacks, because of the Raymond Davis affair, because of last May's attack on Aptabad where Osama bin Laden was killed, and now you have this, this thing. So obviously there is a great escalation in terms of the, the U.S. military attacks on Pakistan. And so now we see that um, as a consequence of uh, this, uh, these uh, border attacks, uh, naturally Pakistan has reacted. So the first thing it did was uh, it stopped all transit facilities for NATO and U.S. supplies that uh, go through Pakistan. Secondly, uh, Pakistan uh, has demanded and asked of the Americans to vacate the Shamsi air base from where uh, many of these drone planes were flown. And um, number three, uh, the, the, um, the, the Pakistanis have uh, stopped all or at least most of the intelligence sharing with the Americans because um, they feel that uh, America cannot be relied upon anymore, that it is a hostile power, that it is uh, reacting in a way that um, uh, these are not the acts of a, an ally or a friendly country. How long do you think such restrictions will last? I mean, after all, Pakistan has implemented such policies before, such restrictions, but has ultimately reversed its decision in the end. Well, uh, that's a good point, of course, and, and you are absolutely right that uh, Pakistan has uh, in the past uh, reversed um, 
its uh, stand against the U.S. It remains to be seen uh, how much uh, backbone uh, the Pakistani military. Obviously, it's the military that would ultimately decide. The civilian government is really very weak. It can't do much. But it remains to be seen. But I think one thing is certain, that uh, relations between the U.S. and Pakistan have nosedived. And naturally, there are other uh, developments of, as well that have contributed to the deterioration of relations between Pakistan and the U.S. Could you elaborate on this? Yes, of course. Uh, you see, um, there have been a number of uh, hostile acts uh, perpetrated by the Americans. As I briefly mentioned earlier, uh, if we look at only the year 2011, uh, there have been uh, increased drone attacks uh, on Pakistan. And when they, they first started back in um, June of 2004, uh, until the present time, the Americans have killed something like 3,000 Pakistani civilians. Wow. Uh, and now that's, that's a lot of civilians to kill, uh, particularly by a country that calls itself an ally of, the, right. of, of Pakistan. Second, uh, in January of 2011, uh, Raymond Davis, who was a CIA contractor, he shot dead two Pakistanis in broad daylight in a, on a busy street in Lahore. And then he even went to his vehicle, took out a camera, took their photographs and so on. And it was at that time that the, the people uh, grabbed him and they handed him over to the police. And ultimately, instead of being put on trial for this murders, two murders that he committed in Pakistan, he was let go. Mm. You know, there was a, some kind of a secret deal that was made internally. Then the second episode that we see that has uh, really contributed to the deterioration in relations is the May 2nd attack by the Americans on a compound in Aptabad, which is the, the place where uh, Pakistan's military academy is located. And uh, Osama bin Laden was killed. That attack was also a blatant violation of Pakistani sovereignty. And yet, after a little while, you know, the situation sort of you know, got back to normal, so to speak. Now, there have been recent developments that I think um, have perhaps um, added to a great deal of anger within the Pakistani military. And that was something that is referred to as memo gate affair. Now, let me explain. <clears throat> you see, soon after that Aptabad attack, um, uh, Hossein Haqqani, who used to be Pakistan's ambassador in Washington, D.C., uh, and he's a pretty shady character, I think, I mean, you know, let's, let's be very honest about it. Um, he contacted uh, another Pakistani-American, another shady character by the name of Man Mansoor Ijaz. Mm -hmm. And Mansoor Ij Ijaz, of course, is a shifty character. He has got, you know, contacts with all kinds of other shady characters within the U.S., including the intelligence community, et cetera, et cetera. So Haqqani uh, asked him to deliver a message to Admiral Mike Mullen. Now, Admiral Mike Mullen, who recently retired as the Chairman Joint Chiefs of Staffs of the United States military, uh, Haqqani actually conveyed a message to him to say that um, Mullen should exert pressure on the Pakistani military not to stage a coup to overthrow Asif Ali Zardari. Mm -hmm. Because the military was very unhappy about the manner in which the, the Aptabad attack had taken place. And it has now come, become clear that definitely Zardari and Haqqani were both aware of this, that the Americans were going to attack that place. And apparently, for some reason, the Pakistani military was not uh, made aware of this. Mm -hmm. And so the Pakistani military is extremely upset. And so as a consequence of that, relations with the U.S. have uh, again deteriorated. And so uh, this kind of uh, sort of, you know, situation has arisen. And of course, uh, the Pakistanis are sort of, you know, taking steps in order to um, distance themselves from the Americans. So what we get of the Pakistani economy is that it's extremely weak and it probably wouldn't be able to do without U.S. help. How true do you think that is? Well, actually, uh, this is not quite true. Um, the fact is that uh, Pakistan is not really a poor country. Um, it is definitely very poorly governed and poorly managed. That's the problem. And also, uh, there is a lot of corruption. You see, both the civilians as well as the military top brass um, 
arrogate a lot of the resources of the country to themselves for their personal use. Uh, and let me, let me give you some examples. So for instance, um, over the last 10 years since this uh, so-called US war on terror, but actually war on the Muslims as well as on Afghanistan has been going on, uh, the U.S. has given something like $12 billion to Pakistan. Mm -hmm. And this is presented as if this is um, aid. This is free money that has been given to Pakistan. That's not true. The bulk of this money has been given to Pakistan for services rendered. What that means is that Pakistan has provided its uh, airfields, like the Shamsi Air Base, as well as the Jacobabad Air Base to the Americans. They've leased it to them. Secondly, Pakistan has used, uh, provided transit facilities for U.S. and NATO supplies to go into Afghanistan for transportation, for fuel, and for the deployment of Pakistani army on the border, which about 120,000 Pakistani soldiers have been de deployed there. All of these cost money. So what it is is that Pakistan has actually provided services for which the Americans have made these payments. Now look at the flip side of it. What has happened to Pakistan in the last 10 years? Bombings, Killings, mayhem have increased in Pakistan astronomically. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are times when people cannot leave their homes. They are sort of locked down. Uh, there is total chaos. And according to the most conservative estimates, the Pakistani treasury has lost $70 billion wow. over the last 10 years. So look at it. Even if we look at purely in dollar terms, $12 billion come from outside for services that Pakistan has rendered to the U.S. And Pakistan itself has lost $70 billion. Mm. So it is in the whole to the tune of $58 billion as a consequence of America's war. Right. So Pakistan is at a, at a loss. And then, of course, you know, you have the situation whereby over the last 10 years, at least 30,000 people have been killed in Pakistan by these bombings, American attacks, these drone attacks, and all of these other kinds of terrible things that the Americans have inflicted on Pakistan. So look at it whichever way. This, uh, this alliance that Pakistan has been into with the U.S. has been a total disaster for Pakistan. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it has drained Pakistan's economy. But if you're to be left alone, you to tell the Americans, get the hell out of there, leave us alone, I think Pakistan can manage on its own. If that is the case, then the question does arise, why is Pakistan continuing with this policy? Well, that's an excellent question. Um, uh, you know, uh, it, it was Henry Kissinger who uh, made a very, you know, I mean, he said it jokingly, but it was a very memorable statement. He said that it's dangerous to be America's enemy, but it's disastrous to be America's friend. <laughs> and I think Pakistan proves this very eloquently, that mm -hmm. it has proved to be a total disaster for Pakistan to be uh, America's friend. Now, you see, uh, it, it is obvious that uh, America is not really uh, a grateful ally. It does not appreciate what is done for it. It is um, very selfish. And I think the sooner the Pakistanis uh, extricate themselves from this situation, I believe, uh, the sooner, the, the better it would be for uh, Pakistan. Do you think that the resignation of Haqqani as the ambassador and uh, Zardari's difficulties part of this policy reorientation? I think that is true, yes. Uh, first of all, you see, let's look at um, Haqqani's resignation. It came about as a consequence of this um, exposure uh, in, a, in an article that was published in the Financial Times of London by uh, a shady character by the name of Mansoor Ijaz. Uh, he's a Pakistani-American. He's linked with all kinds of shady characters in the U.S., including members of the intelligence community. Mm -hmm. Now, last May, when the Americans had attacked Aptabad, uh, to that compound in Aptabad to, to kill Osama bin Laden, information has emerged that this was known both to Zardari as well as to Haqqani. And yet they kept the Pakistani military in the dark. They didn't tell them about this, that the Americans were going to attack. So number one. Soon thereafter, Haqqani contacted Mansoor Ijaz and asked him to communicate a message to Admiral Mike Mullen, who recently uh, retired as chairman, joint chiefs of staff of the US military. And the message that Haqqani wanted conveyed to Mullen was to tell him that he should come down hard on the Pakistani military to make sure that they do not carry out a coup against Zardari. Hmm. Now, if you look at this scenario, both Haqqani and Zardari actually committed treason. 
because you don't conspire with one organ of your country, no matter how bad it is, to go to a third country and sort of have them involved in your internal affairs. Right. So naturally, Haqqani had to go, and of course he has been put on the exit control list. That means he cannot leave the country. And after this uh, disastrous uh, things came to light, uh, Zardari announced that he was going to address uh, a joint session of parliament, that means the National Assembly as well as the Senate, and he would explain exactly what has happened. But instead of doing that, on December 6th, he fled the country and went to Dubai. And his spokesperson said, well, you know, Zardari is not feeling well. He's suffering from heart ailments. That's why he has had to go to Dubai. Mm -hmm. The question that we need to ask is, weren't, aren't there any uh, cardiac specialists in Pakistan? Aren't Pakistani hospitals good enough? I mean, after all, there are 180 million or 190 million people living in Pakistan with all those facilities. So why is it necessary for Zardari to flee the country to go to Dubai? I'm absolutely convinced that, you know, this is just an excuse. Mm. The fact is that he cannot face the music. That's why he fled the country. And I think what should really be done is that um, both Haqqani and Zardari should be put on trial. Haqqani should be put on trial for treason. Zardari should be impeached as the constitution calls for because of treason that he has committed against the country. What other steps can Pakistan take? Well, you see, uh, I, I personally feel, and I've written about this extensively in the Crescent as well on many occasions, that for Pakistan to get out of the mess that it is in, it needs an Iran-style Islamic revolution. But regrettably, that won't happen. Because, you know, there is no leadership, there is no sort of, you know, um, uh, you know a, a popular-based mass movement in Pakistan. So, short of that, I think, uh, you know, these corrupt people like Zardari and the Sharif brothers and others should be weeded out completely. And all of the politicians in Pakistan should be held accountable for, they should uh, declare what their assets are and uh, declare where they got this money from and declare how much tax they have paid on this. And unfortunately, they, have, they haven't done that. Now, you see, there is also, of course, uh, nowadays there is talk in Pakistan that um, uh, Imran Khan probably would come to power. And perhaps there is a possibility that he might. If there were fair and honest elections held in Pakistan, I think that might happen. Um, at the same time, I think uh, what really needs to be done is that that system that is in Pakistan, it's completely rotten. It needs to be changed. I mean, you know, people ought to start paying their taxes. They ought to be, uh, you know, uh, they ought to be made to feel that they need to stand on their own feet. And most importantly, I think the people of Pakistan need to be given hope, not false hope, but a realistic hope that, uh, you know, Pakistan is not about to disintegrate, that it can stand on its feet, and I think this should be done. Externally, I believe that it's imperative that Pakistan uh, reduces its links with America as much as possible. Obviously, I'm not suggesting that it should cut off its links with America mm -hmm. because countries need to deal with each other. But it should reduce its dependence on America. And I think at the same time, Pakistan should cultivate much closer links with its neighbors, particularly Iran, China, and Russia. And if that were to happen, then obviously, uh, you know, Pakistan would, would be in a better situation. And I think it's also important to understand that... Um, you know, in Pakistan, there are uh, a number of people that are treated, or institutions as well, that are treated as sacred cows. So, for instance, uh, the politicians, these feudal lords, the military top brass, these people have enormous privileges, whereas mm. the ordinary people suffer greatly. And I think these privileges should be withdrawn from them. I mean, if you look at, for instance, uh, Pakistan's neighbor, um, Iran, Mm -hmm. uh, there are no privileges given to the president. I mean, you know, he leads a very ordinary life, and he doesn't go around flying in these executive jets or, you know, living in palaces, whereas the people live, uh, you know, in, in very uh, deep poverty. In Pakistan, it's exactly the opposite. Okay, so what changes would you like to see uh, be implemented immediately in Pakistan? Well, I think the first thing they ought to do is to hand, me, hand power over to me. <laughs> I will, I will sort them out. Oh, I think the Americans would be more worried about you. <laughs> well, uh, you are right. But, but I know that, you know, they won't do that. So, obviously, short of that, here is what I would suggest. Uh, first of all, internally, I think certain immediate steps uh, need to be taken. There should be immediate accountability of all of the politicians, of their wealth, 
and their taxes and their spouses and their families, etc. Let them explain where they got all these billions and billions of dollars from, whether they have bank accounts abroad, and why do they have those bank accounts abroad. Similarly, uh, they, there should be strict adherence to the constitution of Pakistan. You know, it's one of the funny things. I mean, the Pakistani constitution is not a bad document. It's a very good document. The tragedy is that nobody follows it. Mm -hmm. You know, for instance, if the constitution were fairly applied, uh, then um, I believe that, um, you know, most of the politicians would not be eligible to run for office. But obviously, <laughs> nobody cares for the constitution, you see? Right. So, and uh, also, I would insist that there should be immediate elections in Pakistan, and they should ensure that people's votes are not bought, because that's what happens in elections. All these feudal lords, they have billions and billions of rupees, they go and buy people's votes, and then they say, well, we are representatives of the people. That's not representation of the people. That's mm -hmm. basically dishonesty. They have cheated their way to power, and then when they come to power, they basically start plundering the resources of the country. But given the obvious lack of savory characters in the country, who exactly would you entrust to implement these changes? I think if, let's say, somebody like the, the current uh, Chief Justice of Pakistan, Justice um, Iftikhar Chaudhry, were asked to supervise elections in Pakistan, I'm confident that he would put together a team of competent people and hold free and fair elections in Pakistan. And um, it is more than likely, I mean, there is general feeling within the country now that perhaps uh, Imran Khan might emerge, uh, emerge with a majority of seats in the National Assembly, that he might become the prime minister. Now, obviously, uh, Imran Khan has shown, as, as a result of his own hard work and honesty, uh, that he is the kind of person that can deliver results. So, for instance, you know, we, we know that he set up the Shaukat Khanam Memorial uh, Hospital for cancer patients in Lahore. And he established this hospital by contributing his own funds, as well as going around to people soliciting funds from them. Mm -hmm. And people trusted him with this money. And he set up a hospital. Second, Imran Khan has established a university in Pakistan. Now, the question we need to ask is, um, all of these other politicians who have served as presidents or prime ministers or ministers or members of the National Assembly, etc., which one of them has established a hospital or a university? Mm. Obviously, none of them, because they're all, they're all thieves. So we see that you, we have a situation whereby at least there is an honest person who is willing to do something for the people. Well, that definitely gives us quite a bit to think about, um, Pakistanis and the people, people all over the world, really. So thank you for your input and your insight on this topic. It's my great pleasure. Thank you very much. That's the end of our program. Thank you for our viewers for joining us once again on another episode of Muslim Perspectives. Please be sure to join us next week, same time, same channel. For Muslim Perspectives, I'm Afifa Khawaja. The noble messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is revered and loved by all Muslims but there is one aspect of his blessed life that is not well known and that is the treaties he entered into as well as the letters he wrote to kings and rulers of neighboring countries. For the first time this book, Power Manifestations of the Seerah, examining the letters and treaties of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam discusses this crucial topic in detail. The book is now available at a special price of $30, including shipping and handling anywhere in North America. Order from Crescent International, P.O. Box 747, Gormley, Ontario, L0H1G0, or call us 905-887-8913. Order your copy today.